So when I was 15, I raised my hand when my formidable English teacher asked for volunteers from my class for some of us to join our school's public speaking team. And I went to a Catholic comp, and I was really never much cop at netball or hockey. So I thought, well, scrapping it out with all the local schools just by talking was much more up my street. So our teacher asked me to go home over the weekend and write a speech about something I cared about. Bring her the first draft on Monday morning. So Monday morning came, I piled into school, holding the draft. I was really, really proud of the work I'd done over the weekend. I'd researched it, I'd written a draft, and I'd put together what I thought was a really strong liberal case that addressed a thorny issue that was a really hot topic amongst the year 10s. And it was really clear to 15-year-old me that decriminalising certain recreational activities was absolutely the way the country should be going. So my teacher took the draft, thanked me, and said she just might give it a bit of a tweak, give it a polish, if you like. And I was really excited to see what she'd do with it. So when it came back, though, my teacher had completely flipped over the speech, and what I'd argued in favour of decriminalising, the speech was now forcefully making the completely opposite case. And my teacher reasoned with me that we were entering a competition being run by the Business and Professional Women's Public Speaking Association. This was an organisation filled with very conservative women. And that's conservative with both a small and a large C. So think about lots of twin sets, pearls as far as the eye can see. And we were up against all of the local private schools to boot. And I didn't believe what was in this new speech. That wasn't how I felt. But we went to the competition, I delivered the speech, and I won. I won the prize for the best main speaker in the Northwest. And that should have felt absolutely great. But it felt really hollow because I didn't believe in what I'd said. And that has stayed with me ever since. Now, every person in this room, I am sure, is here because we believe. We believe and we want to be part of getting our country back on track. But for us Lib Dems, it can be tough, right? The die isn't always cast in our favour. The hopeless first-past-the-post system, layers of vested interest, and a media landscape that isn't always wanting to hear what we have to say. But we keep going because it really matters. And like me, you might believe that the most important thing for our country right now is to get rid of this appalling Conservative government. Yay. And you might want to get rid of them because they're just plain wrong on ideological grounds. Like the way they drove the economy off a cliff with their swivel-eyed mini-budget or their desperate search for wedge issues to whip up a fake culture war in the grubby hunt in the gutter for votes. Or it might be the utterly shameful way they treat those seeking asylum. And it might be because you oppose them and absolutely everything they stand for, or it might be because they're just not very good. This Conservative government is so spectacularly incompetent that school roofs are collapsing because they failed to fix them. Our NHS and care system is on its knees. And water companies are allowed to pump raw sewage into our rivers with impunity on this Tory government's watch. Now, I've had big jobs in international finance and I've run multi-million pound charities and done brilliant things like sent girls to school in sub-Saharan Africa. And in pretty much any other line of work, this lot would have been sacked long ago for gross incompetence. So whether it's because they're heartless or just blooming hopeless, each and every one of us in this room has a moral imperative to remove this Conservative government at the next election and it cannot come soon enough.
But you might be sitting there thinking, well, what difference can one person make? What difference can one MP make? And I'm lucky enough to be the Lib Dem candidate for Hazel Grove, which is, of course, the finest constituency in the land. And I follow in the mighty footsteps of Andrew Stunnell, who was our Lib Dem MP for 18 years before he retired in 2015. And Andrew helped thousands of people during his time. But there's one story that always sticks with me when I'm asked what difference can one MP make. So towards the end of his time as our MP, Andrew helped a couple. They were battling to get a round of IVF. And the rules weren't the same everywhere. The couple was hitting brick wall after brick wall, and it took Andrew fighting their corner to get the rules changed so that they could get what they needed. And the IVF round was successful. And just before he retired, Andrew went along to their baby son's first birthday party. And Lib Dems at every level, whether it's council, uh, the Senate, the Scottish Parliament, or our Westminster Parliament, we get stuff done. And it might be we get that really irritating pothole fixed. It might be that we protect some green space. It might be that we save the hospital. But this example that I gave is about someone who would not have existed had it not been for that one MP. So yes, absolutely, one extra MP really can make all the difference. That little boy is now heading off to secondary school. And as is right and proper, his mum has a regular Lib Dem delivery round. So that increasingly big boy and those like him are the reasons why we need to get Lib Dems elected. And those of you who've been to any of the brilliant training sessions over this conference will know that we do that by targeting our efforts and targeting our resources in the areas we can make the most impact. We need to be laser focused on getting the maximum possible number of Lib Dems elected at the next general election. I want to see the maximum number of Lib Dems on those green benches. And that means we all, all of us, need to campaign in our nearest target seat. We in, the, in this room, we're the fortunate ones. We know what we believe. We know what can get our country back on the right track. And we found our cause worth fighting for. And the way we get there, the way we fill those green benches, get Lib Dems elected, is by giving liberal solutions to the problems our communities face. We need to listen to our communities and fight for them on the issues they care about. Policy think tanks already exist. Campaign pressure groups already exist. Knit and natter groups already exist. We are the Liberal Democrats. We are a political party and we exist to fight and win elections so that we can serve and empower our communities to get stuff done. The more of us we get elected, the more liberal future our country can have. And it's no secret that most of the places we're fighting to win are currently held by the Conservatives. There are some held by the SNP, of course, a few where we're facing Labour, but we're mostly fighting the Conservatives at the next general election. But what may come as a surprise to some is that we're fighting some of those seats in the north of England. Yes, lots of our effort will be in London and the South East, where many communities are feeling really let down by this Conservative government, and we Lib Dems are best place to defeat them, the Blue Wall. But what if I told you that this feeling of being let down, feeling neglected, feeling taken for granted, reaches far further than an hour's rail journey from Euston? That in the North, this being taken for granted was layered on top of sustained underinvestment in our infrastructure. It's on top of some much trumpeted but often underwhelming devolution deals that still leave communities having to ask for scraps from the Westminster table. The North deserves better. In the north of England, in Cumbria, in Yorkshire, and absolutely in Hazel Grove, we are fighting, and we are fighting to win. I, I first stood for Parliament in Hazel Grove in 2015, and lots of you will remember it wasn't our most successful election. It was a long campaign, it was a gruelling campaign, and like many of you, I am sure, I felt pretty broken by the result. 
And the best way I can describe losing an election that you have put your absolute heart and soul into is something close to a bereavement. And it's made even worse when you see the voting record that is utterly appalling of the person who won. And it's made even worse when you see the shocking mess they're making of running our country. So it was in the aftermath of that 2015 election, I was feeling pretty despairing about the state of the nation and at the face of our party, that I was going through some papers that my mum had found while she was clearing out the loft. And I was working my way through the five stages of grief. And in the back of my mind, I knew I needed to get around to thinking about my future and what role I might play. And I pulled out some of the papers from the loft and they'd probably been in there 20 years or so. And I saw the handwriting of a 15-year-old me. And it was my notes. It was the opening lines from that speech that I gave all those years ago. That prize-winning speech that left me utterly determined to stick to my beliefs. And I knew what I had to do. That speech and the way that speech made me feel is why I'm here today. You and I are here because we believe. We believe that every single extra Lib Dem we can get elected can transform the lives of the people we represent. We believe that liberalism is the key to unlocking our nation's potential. We believe that our country deserves so much better than this Conservative government. Our country is desperate for change. Our country is depending on us. We need to believe in ourselves, get out there and make it happen. Thank you.